until now we've only used relative addresses. Let's now turn our attention to absolute addresses and understand the scenarios under which relative addresses will not do the job and we need something different. Consider now this scenario where we've bought a number of items. Let's say, um, you know, Joe bought an SD card, a flash drive, two SD cards, a flash drive and two styli. Jill bought three SD cards, no flash drives and three styli and so on. And we now want to compute the total cost for each of the persons. Okay, so obviously in order to compute the total cost, we need the prices of the individual items. So let's assume for the time being that the price of an SD card is $10, flash drive is $16 and a stylus costs $15. Okay, so given this scenario, we might write a formula like this for the total cost for uh, the second row, which is for Joe. Right, so we say 10 times B2, okay, which is B2 being the number of SD cards that Joe bought, 16 times C2, C2 contains the number of flash drives, and uh, uh, two times, uh, 15 times D2, and D2 contains how many styli that Joe bought. Right, so obviously this formula is correct to compute the total cost. Okay. Of course, once we write this formula, we can copy this formula to all the other people. And once again, uh, since we are talking about serious spreadsheets and not toy small spreadsheets, we are not going to be concerned with the fact that there are only five people in this because we have to assume that it may not be five, it may be a thousand. Okay. So that is what will prompt us to use Excel's capabilities uh, more most properly. Okay. So so we're not going to say, okay, let's just write the same formula so many times for so many people. So obviously what we are going to do is to write the formula once and copy it for everybody else. And let's say that there are 200 people and we copied the formula for 200 people. Okay, so have we done the job? Uh, well, what if the prices change, right? What if we say, oh, you know what? The price of an SD card is not $10 it's actually $12 or $10.50 or whatever, right? Now, suppose that happens, then we have to do two things, right? We have to go here to the cell E2, change the formula, and of course change this 10 to, let's say 12, okay? But that won't do the job for us completely because we have now copied the formula to so many other cells, to 100 cells or 200 cells, okay? So now we have to repeat that process as well. Okay. Now it's possible sometimes when you do that, it's possible, let's say that on your screen, you're seeing only 30 rows. Okay. And the remaining rows, so let's say the remaining 170 rows are actually below and we need to actually scroll down. There is a chance that when you copy and paste, you might miss out some of those remaining cells. Okay. There's a chance that you might make the mistake. Okay. So there's a small risk in that when the price changes, you have to make a couple of other changes to reflect the new price. You have to change one formula and then you have to make sure that you've copied the formula to all the affected cells. There is a risk that you might miss some of them. So that is why this approach is not a great approach. Remember earlier when I said that we, when we talk about serious spreadsheets, we are concerned about being able to make changes to the spreadsheet easily. So ideally speaking, when there's a change in price, all you really should have to do is to change this price in one place. That's it. You shouldn't have to do anything else. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. So right now, uh, this process is, is not great. So let's say we take a different approach. Okay, so this is just what we were talking about, that when the prices change, uh, we cannot just change the price in one place and therefore let's take a different approach. Now let's say that in a particular place we put down the actual prices. So for example in this case I'm showing you that in row 100 we've got the prices of the SD card, the flash drive and the stylus recorded. So with the prices put in separate cells by themselves we might be tempted to write the formula like this. 
B100 times B2, right? So B100 contains the price of the SD card. So price of the SD card multiplied by number of SD cards. Price of the flash drive multiplied by number of flash drives. Price of the stylus multiplied by number of styli. Okay, and then of course we're going to get the same results because the numbers involved are all the same. Okay, so now the beauty of doing this is if the prices change, you don't have to update any formula. You can leave the formulas as they are and simply go change the values in these cells. And we know that Excel does recalculation, so everything is going to work as expected. So this looks like a great solution uh, to the problem of having to make a change. This formula looks good, except of course, what is our next step? Having got the correct total cost for Joe, we now want to compute the total cost for all the remaining people. And of course, what we are going to do is to copy the formula for all the remaining people. So think about this a little bit. So what will happen if we copy this formula, that is the formula in E2, and put the, paste it into, let's say, the cell E3. Okay, of course, we're going to copy it to all the remaining cells, but let's just consider one single cell. Suppose we copy it from E2 to E3. What exactly is going to get pasted? Now remember, all the addresses in the formula are relative addresses, right? So B100 is a relative address because there's no dollar sign. B2 is also a relative address and so on, right? And we already know that with relative addresses, Excel is going to change the relative address, right? So in, uh, in E2, it was B100 times B2, C100, C2, D100 times D2. When you copy it here, unfortunately, it's going to become B101 times B3, C101 times C3, and D101 times D3. That's what will get copied here. And the result will be zero because in B101, uh, C101, and D101, there's nothing. It's empty. Those cells are empty. So really what we want Excel to do is leave this B100, C100, and D100 alone. Don't change them, but only change B2, C2, and D2. Okay. Right now, if you just copied it as it is, all the addresses are going to change because all of them are relative addresses. Right. So we need a selective way to tell Excel, look, leave these B100, C100, and D100 alone. Don't change them. Just keep them as they are. But B2, C2, and D2, change them when I copy and paste. That's really what we want to achieve. Of course, some people, sometimes what they do is they notice that this change is affecting it, and then they copy the prices also 100 times, right? Which means that they put the prices, repeat the prices in so many cells, and therefore, when Excel does its thing of uh, you know changing the relative address, things still work because they've copied the price. That's not a great solution. That's really a stupid solution. One should not be doing that, right? Uh, and of course, as I've already pointed out, there is this notion of absolute addresses to ensure that Excel is not going to change any of those addresses. Okay, so just to recap, this is what is happening. When we copy it to E3, this is what gets pasted, B101 times B3, C101 times C3, and so on. This is not so great, right? So like I said earlier, we need a way to tell Excel to selectively change the addresses leave B100, C100, D100 alone, change only B2, C2, and D2. We've discussed all of that. Okay, so now ad absolute addresses are designed for exactly this kind of scenario. Okay, so let's take a look at absolute addresses. So the absolute addresses we will be using in this case are addresses like $B, $100. That's an absolute address. You, you will recall that from our previous lecture. Okay, so the dollar signs tell Excel that this is an absolute address and Excel will not change these when we copy and paste a, a formula containing such addresses. Okay, why two dollar signs? Why will one not suffice? Well, in an absolute address, we have a way of specifying whether the row is absolute, the column is absolute, or both are absolute. Okay, so right now, for this particular lecture, we'll just assume that we're going to have two dollar signs and we'll continue Later on, we look at scenarios in which we have only one dollar sign. Okay, so now, exactly as before, we have the prices on row 100, just as before, but we just make a small, subtle change to the formula. Notice that in the formula, instead of just B100, 
the relative address earlier, we just converted that into an absolute address, right? So we now have dollar $B, dollar $100. $C, $100, $D, $100, all of those refer exactly to the very same cells, B100, C100, and D100, except that because they are absolute addresses, when you copy and paste a formula containing such addresses, Excel deals with relative and absolute addresses differently, right? So now what happens is when you copy this uh, formula in E2 and paste it into E3, Excel is going to leave the absolute addresses alone and change only the relative addresses, right? So what is going to get pasted is uh, $B, $100 times B3, $C, $100 times C3, $D, $100 times D3, right? So B2, C2, and D2 became B3, C3, and D3 when we pasted it to uh, to E3. But the $B, $100, $C, $100, $D, $100 were left alone. That's the meaning of an absolute address. Excel doesn't change change them at all. Just leaves the absolute address completely alone, changes only the relative addresses. Okay, so that's the beauty and that's how it's going to work, right? So what we uh, get, we have this and what we paste is uh, as I had discussed earlier. Okay, so now when the prices change, that's the beauty of this. When prices change, we need to only change the prices here, right? Suppose the price of an SD card became 12. All we have to do is simply go and change this 10 to 12. That's it. Single change, one price change, one change to your spreadsheet. End of story. Everything else, because of recalculation, simply ripples through the spreadsheet. You don't have to make any other changes. So there is no risk that you may end up making a change to some parts and forgetting to make the change to other parts there's not all of those issues, right? Once again, think about it. Instead of five students, if you have a thousand students, right? Then if the price changes and you had the earlier relative address, you have to go and now ensure that the formula is updated for all the thousand students. You may make a mistake, but now you don't have to, you don't have that worry because you change the prices in one place and everything else reflects. That's the beauty. Now, there are some options you have in terms of entering absolute addresses. One option, of course, just type the address. You know, if you want to type $B, $10, just type $B, $10, right? But remember, many times when we write formulas which contain addresses, we write the address instead of typing it, we may use the pointing approach to entering an address, right? We may just point at the cell while we are editing a formula we just click on a particular cell and the address of the cell is automatically put into the formula bar, right? So in that case, the first time you click, it's going to put the relative address, but you have a way to change that, right? So you first enter the relative address and then if you're using Windows, if you keep pressing F4, it will change the formula to, you know, different kinds of addresses, right? It will cycle through uh, the relative address will first become an absolute address. You again press F4, it will become uh, one kind of mixed address. You press F4 again, it will become another kind of mixed address. Okay, so that's what you can do. If you're using a, a Mac, you enter the relative address and then press Command T to cycle through the other address options, right? So these are the options you have for how to enter absolute addresses. Of course, you can always type in the absolute address. If you're using pointing, then this approach helps.